All right, I'm ready. Okay, let me just get my clock here so I know where we're at. Well, good morning. I'm I'm uh, Eric Enzard. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, and um, I'm happy to be here talking with you about neuromuscular disease this morning. I've been doing this um, with Osler for a long time. Uh, the first year was somewhere between 2005 and 2006, and it's been really good, and we've helped a lot of people um, pass or do very well on their board. So um, I'm always uh, uh, very happy to participate in these courses. It's been doing it for quite a while. We're gonna talk about four different neuromuscular to uh, topics this morning. Um, the first one will be um, ALS and motor neuron disease. And then we're gonna talk about um, muscle diseases. And then I'm just looking at my phone here for the order and then peripheral neuropathies and then neuromuscular junction. So we'll have a real good tour through neuromuscular disease this morning. Um, I do want to alert you all that based on the published breakdown, the quantitative breakdown of the board exam, 5% um, of the boards are uh, scheduled to be on neuromuscular disease. And just for comparison, it's, it's kind of eye-opening that 4% of the boards are um, designated for stroke. So despite the fact that most of us, if we have any recent trainees or people who are um, shortly out, you know, we spend a lot of time on stroke and it's a very important subject, but for the uh, general boards, um, actually there's as much and, and even a little more on neuromuscular disease. So we'll start off with our tour with motor neuron disease. We'll talk about amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I did want to point out that um, we'll do an overview. Whenever there are practice parameters set up by the American Academy of Neurology, those are really high yield for the board. And um, I've incorporated the ALS practice parameter um, into this uh, talk. So just remember that, that those are high yield things to study are the practice parameters put out by the American Academy of Neurology. And we'll also touch on spinal muscular atrophies. To see, so our objectives are to review clinical syndromes of ALS and care of ALS. Just a second, my, my uh, four, oh, here we go. Just a little delay there on my, uh, I, I've got it now, my forward ending and backwards there. So we're gonna review clinical syndromes of ALS and care of ALS patients. We're gonna talk about natural history. We're gonna talk about the diagnosis. And as I mentioned, we'll talk about the ALS practice parameter recommendations. And then we'll give an overview of um, spinal muscular atrophies. And so ALS, it's important to realize there's a diagnostic triad and you really need all three to make the diagnosis of ALS in these days of um, precision medicine or so-called precision medicine with genetics. Um, you know, this is really a clinical diagnosis. So uh, the clinical uh, syndrome and exam are very important here. So you need all three of these. You need upper motor neuron findings because the First of the two sets involved with ALS are the upper motor neurons that go from the cortex uh, down to the anterior horn cell. You need the lower motor neuron or the anterior horn cell, which goes, of course, from the spinal cord down to the muscle. And then you've got to have progression. ALS is not a static disease. Um, it progresses over time. So what are the demographics? Um, various... Uh, statistics, but uh, the incidence is about two per 100,000. It's slightly more common in males than females, not markedly so. It has a peak age of onset in the 60s, but can range to under 20 years old to uh, definitely over 90 years old as people live longer. There's no racial predilection. A uh, subset of patients uh, have an identifiable hereditary uh, cause or risk for the disease. Uh, genes are mutated in some sporadic ALS patients, and of the hereditary um, uh, 
causes about 20% are what's called uh, SOD1, and that's autosomal dominant, and of the hereditary C9 or F72 is anywhere from about a quarter to 40% of the patients, and that's a repeat, a hexanucleotide repeat. You can see here on the right, we've got the upper motor neuron and right going from the cortex down, uh, crossing over the pyramidal decussation, going through that uh, corticospinal tract, lateral corticospinal tract, going to the yellow cell, which is the lower motor neuron. It is, of course, the nucleus and the anterior horn, and then goes out to the muscle, these things that look like logs here are muscle fibers. And although it's not part of this disease, of course, the blue is the bipolar uh, sensory neuron. So ALS pathology, um, remember I talked about those upper motor neurons going down the lateral corticospinal tracts, and this is a cross-section of spinal cord stained with myelin blue. And you can see here where the asterisks are that it's not staining. There's been a loss of the tract, and that's where the lateral, lateral corticospinal tracts are. There. So the ALS diagnosis, you really need to look for upper motor neuron symptoms. And those are loss of dexterity, slow movements, loss of muscle force in an upper motor neuron pattern. We'll talk about this. This is very important and something you can only really look for clinically. Stiffness and spasticity and emotional lability or what's also called pseudobulbar affect. And so here's the upper motor neuron pattern weakness. It's just a a picture of someone who has an upper motor neuron lesion that's affecting the right side. If this is a right hemiplegia, of course, it'd be due to a uh, left-sided stroke in this patient, most likely. But I just like this picture because it, it really points out to you the upper motor neuron pattern of weakness that in the arms, the flexors, the um, elbow flexors, and the wrist flexors maintain more strength than the extensors. So you get this flexion posture. And in the leg, the extensors are stronger than the flexors. So if you think about this pattern, you'll look for the muscles that are going to be more weak in upper motor neuron lesions, namely the elbow extensors, the wrist extensors, um, the knee flexors, um, the ankle dorsiflexors will be weak. And also, although it's not really apparent from this picture, the hip abductors are weaker than the hip adductors. And that's why we get in another upper motor neuron lesion, cerebral palsy, we get a scissoring gait because the hip adductors pull the knees together and the hip abductors can't um, counteract them because of the weakness from upper motor neuron. So some more upper motor neuron signs include upper, upper motor neuron pattern weakness. We talked about pathologic deep tendon reflexes, a Hoffman sign, spasticity. Um, the lower extremity, you have upper motor neuron weakness, pathologic deep tendon reflex, and you can have a positive Babinski reflex. I put an asterisk there because as you get more lower motor neuron involvement, you can't, uh, due to the weakness, you can't elicit the upgoing toe because of the loss of nerve supply to the extensor hallucis longus. Um, so, so that's um, um, often um, not found in patients with ALS. You get bulbar signs, which include a jaw jerk, palmomental reflex, a glabellar blink that uh, is sustained dysphagia and dysarthria. And then, so we have lower motor neuron symptoms and signs. And again, here's our lower motor neuron here on the, on the uh, yellow cell there. And you get a loss of muscle strength, atrophy, fasciculations, muscle cramps. And from the lower motor neuron symptoms and signs, you get dys dyspnea, dysphagia, and dysarthria. And so this is an old picture, but it shows um, some good signs here that head drop, is very common in ALS, although there are many other things that can cause head drop, so it's not specific for ALS. And upper extremity atrophy is very common. You can see the atrophy of this left arm here and of the hand. And um, that's because there are a lot of anterior horn cells going to the upper extremity. So there's, it's very commonly involved. You know, the distribution of anterior horn cells isn't um, 
constant throughout the length of the spinal cord. And that's why we have a cervical enlargement is because the large numbers of anterior horn cells going to the arm and hand. And ALS can be asymmetric, especially early. You can see the right calf atrophy compared with the left at calf, at calf atrophy. No one really knows why, but um, uh, ALS tends to start at one point along the neuroaxis and then spread contiguously or spread from that point. Um, and so it spreads spatially from where it starts along the neural axis. So tongue atrophy can be seen with bulbar involvement, and this is an atrophic tongue. You can see excessive fasciculations in tongue. Re remember that there's very little adipose tissue over a tongue. So if a, you have someone who has a normal tongue, stick their tongue out of the mouth and look closely, you usually see fasciculation. So fasciculations themselves aren't pathologic, but lots of fasciculations and atrophy are. And the tongue also gets involved by upper motor neuron involvement or cortical bulbar upper motor neurons. So it can become spastic and um, uh, difficult to move. So bulbar onset is, is uh, seen in ALS. And of course that causes problems with speech, uh, causes problems with swallowing. So the pathogenesis, again, there's a subset that's genetic. Uh, there are many uh, sporadic um, causes of ALS or theories about the cause of ALS. So probably, you know, ALS, these are very unique cells in that they're the longest cells in the body, you know, going from the surface of the brain all the way down to, say, the conus medullaris for the lumbosacral anterior horn cells, or going from the cervical spinal cord all the way out to the hand, you know, with, without a synapse, those lower motor neurons in particular, the upper motor neurons are also very lengthy, longer than any other cells in the body. So the cells are under tremendous amount of metabolic stress. There's a lot of energy of transporting things along the cells by axonal transport. So you can have a defective glutamate metabolism, which is an identified cause. There's some autoimmune mechanisms, postulated oxidative stress, cytoskeletal abnormalities, viral infection, apoptosis, and there are multiple risks, including smoking and extreme exercise, which if you think about it is a real stress on these motor neurons. So for example, the um, incidence of ALS, while the relative risk still is very small, but it's definitely increased in extreme endurance athletes, pesticides and veterans, and actually veterans is probably related to the fact that because of their um, job requirements and such that a veteran population with an age match civilian population, the veterans uh, are much more athletic and, and certainly are when they're um, uh, active in the forces. So oxidative stress, about 20% of FALS or familial ALS patients have a missense mutation of the copper zinc superoxide dismutase or that's SOD1 gene. And SOD1 functions to detoxify superoxide anion to form hydro hydrogen peroxide, which is then detoxified to water. And loss of SOD1 can diminish copper zinc binding, causing toxicity and increase free radical formation. So let's talk about the ALS diagnosis, the signs and symptoms at initial presentation, the clinical picture. This is a kind of a landmark study with 318 patients, an Israeli study presenting with symptoms. And of those 318 patients, about two thirds presented with weakness. Between a fifth and a quarter presented with bulbar signs, about 10% presented with atrophy of muscle. Similarly, about 10% presented with pain and cramps. Only about three or 4% pre presented with fasciculations. That's definitely higher. You know, these patients were through 1975 before the onset of the internet because people get fasciculation or muscle twitching now and Google it and see much more quickly that it's uh, ALS is one of the possible causes of fasciculation. And that 
has really uh, uh, laid rise to a syndrome that if you do EMG or neuromuscular disease or general neurology, I'm sure you're familiar with, which is a uh, like a Google fasciculation syndrome where people have fasciculations, do a web search, see that it's associated with ALS and the sympathetic drive of that stress causes them to have more fasciculations and um, uh, seek medical or neurological evaluation. Actually, there's been numerous papers presented that when patients have benign fasciculations, meaning that they have fasciculations but EMG is normal, which it, it frequently is in these cases, um, that there's very little risk of that ever progressing to ALS. Paresthesia is seen in some patients. Now, this is a